Hi, everyone. I'm Adam, and um, <clears throat> I have this fancy title, Digital Legacies. But what I actually want to talk about is some old tools and formats and maybe a few lessons that uh, we might take from it uh, for, uh, from the 25 to 40 years of outline-based digital type making. So um, about six weeks ago, I got this email from Greg Thompson, who is a type designer with uh, Type Network, and he asked me whether I could help him revive an old project that he made in around 1990. Um, and he has some files probably made in Photographer 3 or 4, um, but kind of run these tools, so maybe I could help him out. And I thought, well, yeah, that's, you know, I like doing these things. So I opened his zip, and uh, then there were like these three files. And I thought, well, it's hard to tell what format that is. So, uh, because, of course, you know, back then in 1990, um, there were font wars going on, and um, IBM, for instance, would be taking no prisoners in them and uh, quite a few companies would be pushing font imitation formats and uh, going head to head. So there were really quite a few source and shipping uh, font formats. So, well, what should I do, I thought. Probably I'll turn to my general font format savior, which may be an interesting choice, but um, CorelDRAW was a fantastic uh, drawing application for Windows. And uh, one of the great things they did was that um, they've um, actually bundled CorelDRAW with 450 titles of literature. You could get, you know, philosophy, drama. So basically, you buy a graphic design software, and you also get Dostoevsky. I thought it was a great concept. <laughs> um, and CorelDRAW 2, uh, which had its own uh, format, WFN, um, had this uh, utility uh, called WFN Boss, which I, I really um, like uh, using. So note the icon. Um, and it uh, supported a large number of different um, formats, but unfortunately, it couldn't open the files from Greg. So I thought, okay, maybe I need a different converter. Uh, one that also has a similar, uses a similar icon. Um, this uh, trans type made by the company I work for. If you note that there is a, a kind of motif that I thought would be lovely because WFN Boss was my first one. But no, this one's too, too new. You know, it doesn't understand that format either. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to turn to Altsys Photographer, supposedly a capable font making package. Um, also one that uh, includes, um, uses Nimbus Q technology license from the company. Um, actually licensed from URW through the company, I believe, to generate hints. Okay, I'll try that. So, Photographer 3.5, you know, developed by Alsys in 85, a company started by Jim Von Air, uh, and existed until about 92 as Alsys Photographer, and since I like to, you know, carry a couple of operating systems with me around on my computer just in case, I've, I thought, okay, I'm going to start, you know, my, my portable Mac OS 9, and um, then I'm going to, well, grab, open, look at the files that uh, I got, and then, yeah, they do open in Fog 3.5. Okay, so I thought, but there, the made in 1990, which was before Photographer 3.5, so they probably made in an older version of Fog, like 3.0. So I would save them in the 3.5 file format, and then I would go to the next step, which would be Photographer 4.1, uh, when Macromedia took over Alsys, they would continue developing Photographer for some time, and Photographer could open the older files and saved in its own newer format. So I tried this and, uh, well, opened my Photographer 414, non-FPU, very important, uh, because that's the only version that works in this emulator. 
And then, yeah, I could open, and then I could, um, you know, save in the newer format, which is called FOG. And then I could stri go straight uh, on to FontLab 6, published last year, but the company I work uh, for, developed by Yuri Yarmola and others, which includes portions of Fontographer because we were privileged to acquire Fontographer from Micromedia in 2005. And indeed, I uh, could you know, take the FOG files that uh, my Mac OS 9 saved and open them in FontLab 6, and then I would save and export them in a couple of different formats and send them back to Greg, and he was rather happy. Um, because he can now continue and actually expand on the project that he started 20 years ago. Um, so, but this, of course, didn't, you know, it didn't all start with Fontographer. It started outline-based uh, font editing or type design. Started uh, pretty much, I would say, with Icarus 1975. Uh, published by a uh, German Hamburg-based company, URW, originally made by Dr. Peter Caro, and then uh, developed um, on, in different stages by uh, different people. Some of them are actually here. Um, so Dr. Caro actually made, made an interesting also observation, and this is something that I would like to, to touch on, as the um, relaxed gentleman on the right. He published this book in which he says, hand digitization appears to be unsuitable for Bezier curves because Bezier control points are located off the outline. So um, they can be manipulated, but they, that format, the Bezier uh, curves as we know them today, did not necessarily lend itself very well to the, to the predominant method of working at the time, which was digitization. So this is... a uh, you know, gadgets of Eric Spiekermann, photographed by Norman Posselt here. Um, this shows a work, sort of a version of um, Icarus, uh, much more modern Icarus uh, uh, workstation with a digitizer. So you would actually always work with some physical drawing. And then, of course, you would sort of trace it manually. So all the points um, that you would put would be put on the outline. And Icarus used, uh, Icarus used uh, a mathematical description that was based on sort of straight and arcs, or pieces of a circle. Um, so these, so you would place these 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 knots. Well, that's or okay. I'm. It didn't use Bezier curves in in this. Let me let me rephrase. Uh, but and the 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 um, you'd make this drawing by clicking along, and then um, the file format that it would be save is is a is a published um, plain text human readable file. And of course, Icarus went through different iterations. This is a picture that I got from Peter van Blockland, uh, showing a plotter uh, which is. Um, which uses Icarus, and it was running on a unif Uniflex workstation, I believe, in 81. Then Peter van Blockland actually ported uh, Icarus to the Mac. This is, uh, uh, unfortunately, this, there's a splash screen animation made by Eric, but unfortunately, this is not animated. And then uh, Icarus was ported to other operating systems, like, uh, um, I'll, I'll just uh, scrape monitors, and then DOS. Um, and then it continued, so uh, today it's still um, sort of developed or uh, at least can be used in the form of Icarus Master. So th here you can see the manipulation of the Icarus outlines using these control points uh, or knots right on the outline. And uh, what I only very few days ago discovered is that uh, there was also another tool that was actually using Bezier's, but with just on-curve knots. And that was Fontaine. There was a tool that was uh, developed in-house by Andrei Skaldin for first polygraph mash and then paragraph and then paratype, uh, who is actually also here, and uh, Konstantin 
Kunarov, who's um, ported it and extended it to Windows. And I, uh, they were kind enough to uh, also g give me a copy of the tool that they developed. And I was very excited because, you know, I've never seen it. And uh, it's, uh, you could open a font. And here you would see this, this is Bezier math, so it's different from Icarus. But the idea is that you would, well, click on, it would, it would have hints. Uh, you would click on the knot and then click on the place where it should go, and then it would move. And it had some, some nice sort of adjustment uh, routines for where you would only adjust one knot and it would kind of interpolate the entire contour to follow. So it was pretty, uh, pretty decent. Um, and then, well, Yuri told me that uh, one of the, that there were two things. One, that basically the um, Fontaine didn't support drag and drop, so you would have to like click at the beginning and click at the end. And FontLab 2.5 supported drag and drop, so he convinced them at Paratype to start using FontLab. Also, FontLab 2.5 was actually using the more, well, modern or the, the kind of approach that we know today, which is, um, which is using uh, Bezier's in a form of nodes and uh, off-curve points or handles. And it had um, some tools that some of us still use. And of course, well, to me back then, uh, a great thing about FontLab 2.5 was the super responsive effects stuff, which, well, <laughs> I must admit, it was, I was impressed. Um, now let's, so we're arriving at this, at this point where, where we do have this Bezier editing with you know, nodes and handles or on and off curve points. And that pretty much uh, stayed on. So you know, if I run this um, Photographer 3.5, even though I'm, I'm really terrible with the sort of Bezier pen tool, but I'm trying to draw an Orgonek, and it's far too small and it's really it's, it's not a good one. But uh, I've never properly learned how to use it, but, but I could, you know, I, it, this is Photographer 3.5, and I could have, okay, there is like a glyph window where I can draw, and then there's a spacing window, and I kind of know the paradigm. It's not so foreign from some of the older tools. That's sort of already, you know, I, I kind of know this. But it was a very simple tool, of course, well, to me it was simple, but of course I never had uh, the pleasure of working with Robofog, which was a super extended uh, version of Photographer 3.5 uh, done by Peter and Eric and Joost. So in, I don't have, I, this is sort of what I would, well, sort of imagine in a sense. This would be, you know, Photographer with this boring splash screen. And now if you had Robofog, you would kind of get this. You would get, you know, some Python scripting and some really cool tools. And uh, instead of this boring splash screen, you would get really cool splash screens uh, updated regularly. So that, that was, mm, was really cool. And uh, it had like a, you know, it was like a font editor with a proper branding. And, but it was based on Fog 3.5. Macromedia continued. Um, to develop uh, Fog, so there was at some point an unreleased 5 beta, and by the way, we will continue after this announcement, but contrary to popular opinion, not all pirates come with patches and peg legs, so don't copy that floppy. <laughs> there were some tools that quite a few of us may have uh, you know, overlooked or were not aware of. I was aware of this other platform, uh, Atari ST, um, which had this um, German-made um, DTP application, Calamus, made by the company DMC in Valuf. And um, they also had uh, their own font format, CFN, which had a very interesting feature. Well, I was aware of Calamus because my first sort of typography guru and the man I kind of, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for like sparking my interest with, with digital typography. Was Stefan is Stefan Stipka, a Warsaw designer who is a big 
a Calamus user who was publishing a magazine about it, writing about it, and also about typography in Poland. And I, um, the, the one aspect unique to uh, type art, which was the font editor for the CFN format, was this. Um, so this is Atari, one of my you know, portable operating systems that I carry with me. And of course you could draw Beziers and... But the, the thing that you could do that you can't do anywhere else was this kerning model. So this is the kerning tool. So you would actually, uh, you know, you would actually basically have these partial side bearings for, uh, separate for each height, and you could adjust them, um, and you could uh, sort of get a decent kerning this way, and then on top of these adjustments that uh, you would get from, from this type of spacing, you, would, you could also add kerning pairs. So in a sense, when, you know, these days we have like class-based kerns and exceptions. So you could also have exceptions, but the sort of class-based kerning was done this way. It was very interesting, and I know Toshi uh, Omagari was interested in it and kind of looked at it as well, made the bubble kern plugin. Uh, but it, I know that this basically works. People were using it. There were quite a few format, uh, fonts in that format. Okay, and then there were still other tools that in addition to drawing, had some, some very unique and um, forward-looking uh, workflow uh, tools. One of them, uh, let us at Font Studio, which Lucas Tehroth uh, told me several times that it was his favorite tool. And uh, uh, that was, um, Font Studio had um, a number of things that I'm not really aware of, but I'm, I'm, you could, of course, draw and measure and have, have a very elegant interface. But one of the nice things was the spacing window, which was kind of really nicely integrated. You had, uh, you know, you, you could adjust the spacing, you could have current as, which was basically class kerning effectively, and you would have a kerning list. It was all integrated, and uh, in addition, you had some nice uh, sort of visual reporting on your hints, and you could, for instance, add a guideline to one glyph or several glyphs or all glyphs uh, with just one click. You know, some things that um, only some tools much later may be implemented in some other way. But there was very, very, unfortunately, it only was, I think, in distribution for about four years. So then I'll just say, so, you know, these days, many tools use this paradigm. So, you know, you may have... Uh, even if it's um, even if it's um, slightly different, maybe drawing tools. In the end, we end up with this manipulation based largely on the nodes and the handles. So why? Um, so so we we do have this unified uh, way of describing the geometry. Something that wasn't really true uh, back in the 90s, and certainly not before. Uh, like in Icarus days, where there were competing, you know, curve systems. We now have basically cubic or quadratic uh, splines that are used uh, across the most popular systems, and tools understand that. And that's a very important thing, because even if they differ in different features, they can, you know, use the same geometry. So, they, so uh, you have a chance of, first of all, sharing your... Um, uh, project files in a human readable format such as UFO, which is really Im important because uh, you may, you know, lose your um, uh, digital media or they will be, become corrupt. But actually this you could print out and, and uh, use, um, you know, you, you actually would have your sources in a, in a, in a, in a human readable form and could theoretically retype them. So if, you know, this is this is this little project that I was playing with. So if I export uh, it in uh, FontLab 6 as UFO, I can, I get this, I get a um, number of files in, in human readable form, and I can open it either in the best font editor ever, Robofont, um, yeah, or um, when I get, you know, I get the same, Geometry. I, I get a different environment, but it's essentially the same data. Or I can open it in uh, glyphs. Um, 
Oops, sorry. Um, so, yep. Yeah, and I could, you know, go back and forth, or at least have have. There will always be some specific aspects of each app, even stored inside the UFO as kind of like extension data that may not translate, but still the most important stuff will be there. And just to finish up, just a f just two little images or uh, films. Font chameleon parametric, you know, sliders. We've been talking about sliders and uh, variable fonts. So this was a uh, tool which used a very complex internal format where, and then as an end user, you would get sliders and you could actually adjust, you know, typographic parameters, but also interpolate between completely different designs. Uh, but my absolutely f sort of mind-blowingly favorite creation was this Incubator Pro and later GX by Sampo Casila, who's also here, uh, which, where you would open um, a normal static true type based font, and you could start doing adjustments, um, which, um, well, I mean, as far as, of course, there's no anti aliasing, but as far as um, you know, decent, like keeping stem widths and doing some adjustment. It's it's doing really. I mean, this was 92, 93, and I don't think that um, this kind of automation is 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 even as a starting point as usual um, available today. This is I've you know I've tried Palatino and I've tried to kind of just the regular true type version, and then I tried you know taking away some weight and add some contrast and uh, it's uh, play with the X height and it, it um, you know, it is, of course it's not, um, well as far as sort of algorithms and, a, and a, a proposal of a potential working model or a uh, method or, or an aid to design, I think that was just spectacular. So thank you very much, that's all for me. Thank you, Adam.